and other than one. And this is the yeah, virus or something. It was a weird virus that lasted for like a couple months. Did you have swollen lymph nodes? Um, I had, yeah, uh, I had swollen lymph nodes everywhere. Oh. Yeah, yeah hard to say. I think I had them. Like, yeah, I had them on my legs and stuff. You have lymph nodes? I'm not very good with anatomy. There's lymph nodes there. Yeah, there's lymph nodes like uh, next to the groin. Oh yeah, I know that. Yeah. But you're, I, it looks like you're pointing at your abdomen, but okay. I didn't want to do it. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I gotcha. I was like, I think that's the intestines, but <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I guess you can probably tell me I believe you. Yeah, you, you missed your chance. Okay. So I guess uh, better move on and talk about periodic trends. So uh, we talked about electronic structure and now, uh, and also how we organize the periodic table. And now we're gonna go on and talk about what we can tell from the periodic table. And one of them is periodic trends, and this is periodic law. And it's not set in like, I say set in stone. It's kind of, I shouldn't talk with idioms. It doesn't work all the time, but it works fairly well. It works, works a very, especially well for the S and P blocks. So, the first trend we're going to talk about is uh, size, atomic radius. And the general trend is the further to the right you go, the smaller the atom, and the further down you are, the bigger the atom. Or you can look at the other way, or the further up you are, the smaller the atom. The further to the right you are, the smaller the atom. The further down you are, the bigger the atom. The further left you are, the bigger the atom. And the reason is because if you look at the alkalis, alkalis are the first column, the first family, they all seem to have a charge of plus one. So, I mean, hydrogen, of course, just has a charge of plus one. So these all have a charge of plus one. Alkaline earths have a charge of plus two meaning. So when you remember, when you look at lithium, so let's do the Bohr model, you have the two electrons there, and then you have one on the inside. And the idea is that the 1s shields does a shielding. So it looks like is shielding 1s. So the, the idea is the 1s orbital provides a shield to it. And then this whole atom kind of looks like a plus one charge. I know lithium has three protons. It should be a plus three, but because of this inner shell, uh, it gets shielded and that atom is a plus. It seems like to this electron here, it seems like the center is plus one. Same thing with sodium. Sodium has 11 electrons. So sodium here, so sodium has 11 electrons. So you would, you would have 10 electrons here in the shield and then one on the outside. The, the 10 electrons, would seem to block 10 of the positive charges of the nucleus, and then it has a plus one charge on the outside. Now you look at the other way around, so that's the alkalis. Let's look at neon, so neon over here. And neon uh, has a plus 10 center, has a plus 10 center, it has the two electrons and then it has the eight electrons. I know I'm using Bohr model on the outside. So these eight electrons, they kind of see a plus eight charge because you have the, the plus 10 charge and it's shielded by two electrons there. So neon really kind of looks like to an, uh, to an electron on the outside, neon looks like a plus eight center. Whereas lithium and sodium look like plus ones and all the way down. So that means that this is plus eight, not helium, it's plus two. Halogens are sort of plus seven, oxygen family plus six, plus five, plus four, plus three, and so on. So let's talk about electrons. Electrons, they're very predictable. They are attracted to positive charges. And the bigger the charge, the more attracted they are. And also the closer they are to the charge, the more attracted they are. So it's, just, it's Coulomb's law. 
So uh, where the force is equal to one over a constant times the charge of one, charge of the second over the distance squared. So what does that mean to have a strong attraction? It means, so R needs to be small and the charge, that's Q is the charge, Q needs to be big. So a big charge and a small distance, that's what makes you attractive to electrons. Um, why is it, so is helium a bigger atom than hydrogen? Helium is a smaller atom than smaller. hydrogen. That's interesting. Yeah. So, yeah, we can start off with that. You can even see the numbers. So, if you, helium is 32 picometers in diameter, or radius, and hydrogen is 37. So helium, of, the, of all the atoms, and neutral atoms, helium is the smallest. So, right, and I'm, I guess I'm at the mine and I'll try and get the camera. So, so imagine uh, the lithium, so the, the alkalizer, they're really big atoms. They're huge atoms and they have a plus one charge, big atom plus one charge. And as you move over across the periodic table, you get skinnier, okay? And when you get to neon, neon's a tiny atom with a really positive charge. So, right, so if you're an electron, so you're this buzzing around electron, who are you more attracted to? The big plus one charge that you can only get like close, like very far away from, or the positive eight charge that you can get really, really close to? And the answer is, of course, the positive eight charge, right? So that's the general idea with, with trends and size. So as you move further to the right, and I already mentioned hydrogen, so you have hydrogen, and then whoop, helium gets smaller. Then look at lithium. See lithium there is 152 picometers in radius. That's pretty big, relatively speaking. And then, so you have, you have lithium, beryllium, boron, carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, fluorine, neon. And I guess I, it's, it's more like by half. So this is lithium. Neon's about half the size. So neon is 70 picometers in radius and lithium is 152. So it's less than half. Yeah, question. Where did the, um, like the electrons and how they're really close to each other, when that would tell them that they're actually make the atom bigger? Uh, it's, a, it's a combination of that, but uh, we'll talk about that a little bit with isoelectronic ions, but um, they get drawn into the center. Even though there's other electrons there, they still get drawn in. Okay. I mean, it's a combination of attraction repulsion. But I mean, if you go by uh, the logic, right? So let's just say it was just the attraction, um, then the radius would be much, much smaller, right? Because because um, uh, charge of one, charge of second. So if you if you look at lithium, it's a plus one, and neon, it's a plus eight. That means that the that the atomic radius of neon by just the charge would be one eighth that of lithium, but it's only a half. Mm -hmm. which means that the other electrons are repelling, which is the reason why it increases by a factor of four-ish. So, so, so the nucleus just kind of overrules most of the factors? Because well, I mean, if you go by the, the previous logic, though, the electrons are repelling each other quite a bit, right? Because because if you had the, the two charges, the, the plus one versus plus eight, you would expect the Coulombic force to be eight times that, mm -hmm. but, but it's not one-eighth the size. It's a half the size, so so the, the repulsion is is, is certainly um, a big factor. So, but um, but yeah, the positive nucleus overcomes the repulsion of the other electrons, generally speaking. So, and electrons don't have the strong force; they only have the electrostatic force, because the nucleus has a strong force and it can overcome the, the repulsion from the positive uh, um, protons. So, other questions? Actually, no one has ever asked me that question before. Okay, electrons? Yeah. So, good job. Okay. 
So uh, I already mentioned, so from, from left to right, radius goes down. But then uh, think of it in terms of shells, right? So here is lithium, sodium as the next shell, potassium, rubidium, cesium. You just get one shell out and then the electron cloud gets bigger. So that's what it is going down. Going down the, the table, it gets bigger. And also combine that with the idea of quantization. So remember with quantum mechanics, you have discrete, you have individual energy levels. And when those lower energy levels are occupied, they, you can't go in them because of Pauli exclusion principle. So once the inner, inner levels are uh, already occupied, you have to go to the outer levels, which means you're further away from the nucleus. So the electron, the single electron, so think of like rubidium here on the far, rubidium is here in the, on, the, on the far left, left corner. It has a plus one center and it's on the, what is the sixth shell. So you have that little electron with uh, really far away from the nucleus, what does it do? So it just gets really big. It just lets itself hang. It gets really, really huge and fills up all that space. You can see it as like talent, like the instant before you accept. Yep. Well, I mean, it's, it's, it's kind of, a, yeah, we mentioned, I guess I am joking around about, you know, weight and fat people, but you know, and then again, here I am in a diet, so. But um, uh, really, uh, it makes the atoms less dense. So the uh, lithium, lithium is really not very dense at all. So on all the alkalis, they're very, very light. That's why we have lithium batteries, because they're not very heavy. And that makes it also easy to react with, right? Or... No, not really. The physical, that, that physical property doesn't have to do with anything with that. It's more uh, lithium is reactive just because of the bonding scheme. Yeah, yeah, and uh, it's it's um, it has a very low reduction potential, meaning it's 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 hard to lithium metal is hard to reduce. It's hard to add electrons to it, so which means it's real easy to rip them off. So when you have them in batteries, it, it puts a it packs a big punch. So, but that's you don't learn about that till next semester. So, but uh. No, a lot of like if you see a lot of these on the on the far left, these are really light metals. We where we use the metal uh, quite a bit for that is magnesium. So, magnesium is a very light metal. Um, they use it for various applications. It's it's used uh, whenever you want uh, a metal that's very light. So rims on tires, they can be made of magnesium. Skis, skis can be made of magnesium. So these kind of things. So versus going really heavy metal. I mean, I mentioned you filled around the, the the platinum. Platinum is really dense. So, but of course that's that's in the transition. It's it's going to be down here. It's going to be under palladium. Platinum is right here. But um, we'll uh, we're not going to talk too much about the the D block. So how are we doing? So any questions? Okay. So uh, and the size one. I start with the size one. This one, if you understand this, you can kind of figure out the rest of them pretty easily. So atomic size, this is a really big one. Um, and oh yeah, I have to show you some more chart, uh, charts. So uh, atomic number, this number of protons, radius, the y-axis. So you can kind of see that something happens. Uh, like just, just looking at this chart, you probably think, hey, there's something special here, 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 and here, right? There's a huge peak that happens at each of those times. And what's happening there is you're getting a new shell. So this is the new, and these are the new periods. So you can see that period being rows, rows in the periodic table. So you can kind of right away see something going on. And uh, if you just track these, if you look from left to right, you can see they go down in size. I mean, there's a couple exceptions. I mean, you can kind of see there's something funny going on there and certainly funny, funny going on here. And I don't know what the heck's going on there, you know? So, uh, and you can see that it's more complicated, you know, like why, you know, that uh, you mentioned like why, what's chemistry class unless I mention you some rules and exceptions to the rules and exceptions to those exceptions, right? So, 
this is a general rule. The general rule is you can see from these data moving from left to right, the size goes down. And also when you get each of these new shells, so when you go here, 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 that as you as you go uh, like on the on the you know looking at those peaks going to the right, going to this way, the size goes up. And that's that's the same thing as going down a column on the periodic table. So you can kind of see the general trend there. And that's just it's a general trend. It's not like, oh, this is the only way it happens. You can already see there's something weird going on here. But the general trend is so going from left to right, size goes down, and going down, that's the size goes up. What is element uh, 30 and 21? Element 30. Uh, that's going to be, I think 30 is 20. 20, OK. Yeah. 30, and 30 is zinc and copper. So, okay. And kind of already mentioned, effective nuclear charge, it uh, increases as you move to the right. So, and the reason for that is the shielding and, the, and this is the number of, number of protons. So as you move from left to right, the positive center or the apparent positive charge of the nucleus increases. At least that's what the outermost electrons, the valence electrons feel is an increase in and positive charge. So, and of course, I already mentioned that. So let's do the logic on this. On the basis of periodic trends, choose, choose the larger atom in each pair. So let's look at aluminum. So we have aluminum and fluorine. I'm sorry, nitrogen. I'm sorry, nitrogen. I'm sorry. Jeez, what am I saying? <laughs> I was looking at C for some reason, uh, nitrogen or fluorine. So uh, the trend is the positive direction is uh, going towards the left and going down. So nitrogen is further to the left. So nitrogen is further to the left. Therefore, nitrogen is the bigger atom than fluorine, so larger atom. So, Nitrogen is going to be larger than fluorine. Make sense? Okay. So carbon or germanium. So germanium is lower. So germanium is further down than carbon. Therefore, it's a positive direction. So germanium is the larger atom. Questions with this one? And I, uh, I am using red ink for that. So next I'm gonna use yellow ink. So nitrogen again and aluminum. So aluminum is further to the left and it's also below. So this is a double positive. Aluminum is definitely bigger than nitrogen. So by, by two reasons. So questions there? And then what color should I use? I'll use green. So now we have aluminum and germanium here. So 13 and 32. So aluminum should be bigger because it's further to the left and germanium should be bigger because it's further down. So actually we cannot use periodic trends for this one. We can look at data. So let's see here. Aluminum is 143 and germanium is 122. So the answer is aluminum. The, the answer, the, the answer is aluminum, but we don't know that by periodic trends. So that's an ambiguous question, ambiguous question. You cannot tell by using periodic trends, which one is bigger. So questions with this? Okay. Something else I'll talk about, uh, diamagnetic versus paramagnetic. Diamagnetic means all electrons are paired, and paramagnetic means one or more unpaired electron. So uh, we haven't talked about electronegativity yet, but this is nothing to do with reactivity or electronegativity. 
Uh, this is, only has to do with the magnetic properties of atoms. So, and also electrons are taken from the highest n, highest principal quantum number n. So write the electron configuration and orbital diagram for each ion and determine whether it's paramagnetic or diamagnetic. So let me show you an example, aluminum plus three. Let's look at aluminum metal. Aluminum metal is gonna be neons, 1s squared, 2s squared, and then uh, 2p6, then it's gonna be 3s squared, 3p1. So meaning, oh, where's the parak table? There we go. So, right, it's neons configuration, 2, 3s2, 3p1, there's aluminum, right? So aluminum is there. So as written here, and now we have aluminum plus three, it's gonna be, so you're gonna lose three electrons from the highest N and the highest N is right there. So it's going to be 1s squared, 2s squared, 2p6, 3s0, 3p0. I'm just indicating the electrons have been ripped from those orbitals. And that means the diagram is going to be 1s, 2s, 2p, 1, 2, 3, 4. Uh, so six electrons, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. So everything is paired, all the electrons are paired. This is diamagnetic. So all of these electrons have been paired. Therefore, uh, there is no external magnetic field from aluminum, uh, aluminum plus three ion. So do you, does it make sense? Do you have any questions with this? Okay. So let's then look at sulfur minus two. So again, let's just look at sulfur. Sulfur is going to be 1s squared, 2s squared, 2p6, neon, 3s squared, 3p, it's going to be 4, 3p4. So where am I getting that? So neons again. So uh, 3s squared. 3p1234 for sulfur, 3p4. So like this, and so then sulfur minus two, we need to add two electrons. It's gonna be 1s squared, 2s squared, 2p6, 3s squared, 3p6. And let me just do the 3s. And the 3p, two in there, one, two, three, four, five, six, 3p6, 3s squared. Everything is paired. This is diamagnetic. I remember that. Up. So diamagnetic. Questions with this one? All right, now we'll look at iron. What color should you use iron? I should have used blue for iron because it has a plus because it has a it looks blue in solution. Anyways, so iron plus three. So let's look at just plain old iron. Uh, it's going to be one s squared, two s squared. Actually, uh, well, it's going to be um, argons. Two uh, p six. Uh, 3s squared, 3p6, 4s squared, 3d6, uh, I think. Is that what iron is? So iron is right here. So it's going to be argons configuration, 4s squared, 3d, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. Okay, which is which is there, and I'll just go ahead and put argon four s squared three d six. So that means iron plus three. You lose from the highest n first, 
argon is going to be 4s0 3d5. So highest end first, and you have three, you're losing three electrons. The 4s gets taken first. It's not, it's not going to be 4s squared 3d3. Um, this is wrong. You don't rip three electrons from the D. You rip two electrons from the S and then the remaining one from the D. Okay, and then, which means this, you have 4S, 3D, no electrons in 4S, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. And you can see then definitely iron plus three is most definitely paramagnetic. And in fact, uh, iron, iron metal, and many of the, the uh, compounds with it is one of the few that is also known as ferromagnetic at this temperature. So there are some things that can be paramagnetic and ferromagnetic at really low temperatures. Cobalt, nickel, and iron are the only elements that can be ferromagnetic at this temperature. I'm not going to go over the difference between ferromagnetic and paramagnetic yet. But if you go on and study solid, solid state physics, you can learn more about that. But not surprisingly, you know, what we learned in chemistry class today, iron is very magnetic. You know, another big shock that you'll never, you know, live through again, right? So well, I think most people know that iron is relatively magnetic. So what does this mean? It only has to do with magnetic properties and how elements will respond to external magnetic fields. It has nothing to do with reactivity. So gold, gold is paramagnetic and it is very unreactive. Lithium is paramagnetic. It's extremely reactive. So same thing with fluorine. Fluorine is paramagnetic, very reactive. And let's see here, um, argon, argon and neon, these are diamagnetic and they are very unreactive. And calcium, calcium is, is diamagnetic. It's extremely reactive. So reactivity has nothing to do with magnetic properties. So, and that's a very common misconception students have, so. In some cases, it, it makes sense because they line up diamagnetic and reactive, or not reactive. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it, it, it would seem to make more sense, but it's not always the case. So, the next thing we're going to talk about are isoelectronic. So, isoelectronic. Ion. So iso means same. Isoelectronic means same number of electrons. So same electric structure. So, uh, and uh, I used to just briefly go over this. And I, I find that whenever I ask questions on this, uh, only one third of the class would get it right. Now I've been talking more about it. And Two thirds of the class gets the questions right. So I'm hoping, although I, I'm looking at the attendance right now, we only have seven people attending in Zoom and or on, you know, face to face. So, uh, which is weird. I don't know why everyone decided not to show up today. But um, anyways, so uh, hopefully all you guys get all these questions right. So let's look at sulfur minus two. Sulfur minus two sulfur, and if you go to the periodic table, so sulfur has 16 protons, chlorine has 17, argon has 18 protons, and that means then the potassium is going to have 19 and calcium is going to have 20. So if you look here, so sulfur minus two, it has 18 electrons, uh, chloride has 18 electrons. Argon, I'm putting, I'm inserting argon. Argon atom has 18 electrons. Same thing as potassium plus one. Same thing with calcium plus two. So the difference is, 
that sulfur minus two has 16 protons, chloride has 17 protons, argon has 18 protons, potassium plus one, 19, calcium plus two, 20 protons. So these all have the same number of uh, electrons, but different number of protons. So when you look at these, the um, generally speaking, well, the, the, the bigger, uh, well, the more positive center, it's gonna draw in the electron cloud more. So here is a, a uh, very weak positive center. You increase positive center, what happens? The atom shrinks. So also, or I should say the, the atom and or ion. So, and this is also true generally speaking about atoms and ions. So if you have a neutral atom, if you add electron density to it, it blows up, okay? So it gets big. And then if you have a, an atom and you rip off electrons, it gets smaller. So that's how it, it goes. And uh, this can also, uh, this especially has applications in biological surfaces. So uh, we haven't talked too much about acids and bases yet. General idea with acids and bases, acids tend to add positive, they don't tend to. Acids add pos positive charge, bases add negative charge. So uh, let's say you get stung by a jellyfish and you have the tentacles on you. What do you do? How do you get rid of the stingers? How do you keep it from stinging you? You put acid on it. So you have, you have, you have the, any, also biological surfaces, they're all negatively charged. So hair, skin, cell, cell membranes, cell membranes are phospholipid bilayers. They're all negatively charged. So when you add negative charge at a base to biological, surf, biological surfaces, the, it expands. If you add acids, they contract. So if you have a jellyfish tentacles on you, you wash the area with acid. So then the stinger cells shrink and close, and then you stop getting stung. So isn't uh, acid, I won't say mostly, but like acid base is a negative charge? Yeah, but that's just a name. Acetate, but acid, acetic acid vinegar is positive charge. Well, that's positive charge. Well, what, what, what? I thought it's neutral or no? Well, it is neutral, but acetic acid is going to add hydrogen ions to the surface. Gotcha. Okay. Yeah. So, um, also for hair chemistry. So, if you want to, if you want to do chemistry on your hair, um, so if you say you want to dye your hair, what you do is you add base to the hair. So you have your hair follicle. You add base, which is negative charge. Yep. It blows up the hair follicle, and then you can then you can put dye in, and then wash it. It shrinks down. Now you have hair with dye stuck in it. Or you can open up and you can do chemistry on the dye. So things like um, if you bleach your hair, bleach is already at, uh, is basic. But then you can that can you can oxidize the melanin, fair melanin in your hair, and then I mean over time, or if you wash it, the hair shrinks back down and you've changed the color of your hair. So that's also how you can do that. So, but okay. So choose the larger ion from the pair. So sulfur or sulfide. So uh, let's see here, sulfur has, this has 16 electrons, 16 protons. This has 18 electrons, 16 protons. The, uh, the sulfide, this one here, it just gets bigger. So remember that when you have an ion, an atom, you add electrons to it, it gets bigger. So because you had electric negative charge, electrons are clouds and they don't like each other. So how do you, how do you deal? Like when you see someone you hate and you can't stand to be around, like I wanna give that person a hug, right? No, you don't. You're like, you're over there, I'm over here, we're good. You stay over there away from me. So even, even you know, more so now that I guess pandemic, you know, it was probably pre-pandemic rules. It was even further than six feet, right? You're like, get me away from that person. That's what electrons are. You negatively charged being, I don't like you. Okay, I, I have to be with you because I'm electron. So what am I gonna do? I'm just gonna make myself really big. So that way I don't have to look at you very much. So my, my amount of contact that I have with you with my electron cloud and your electron cloud is as little as possible. 
our little force there impossible so just oop, blows up okay and opposite is true for calcium plus two so calcium 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 what am i saying this has 20 electrons and 20 protons this has 18 electrons and 20 protons and when you rip electrons off the size goes down the larger atom is calcium so right so when you have an atom and or ion you take away electrons shoop, it shrinks if you get electrons it gets big and also same thing for acids and bases so for a negatively charged surface if you add also a positively charged surface even as well you add and generally speaking when you add acids to things they shrink especially biological surfaces and if you add bases to something they get bigger question so if you had acid acetate or vinegar um this is probably getting complicated but like do the electrons flow through the whole molecule or do they stay within the molecule? they uh they'll flow through the adjacent elements but that that molecule won't the electron cloud will not flow through the whole one generally speaking they kind of stay in the area look they they too they tend to stay pretty close to one or to, to one or two atomic centers although you can have effects where the electron density can be shifted but the general trend is to stay within one or two atomic centers. So that'll come up more later. Okay, bromide or krypton. So let's go back to the periodic table. So here is bromine and krypton. And you can see there are the bromide is gonna have 36 electrons. Sorry, you can't see that as well because I'm zooming in, 36 electrons. So I know, it's, I know it's element number 35, but then the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the minus one is gonna turn up the number of electrons to 36. So, okay, so looking at bromide and krypton, so bromide is gonna have 36 electrons. Can you see? No, not really that well. 36 electrons and 35 protons. Krypton has 36 electrons, 36 protons. Which one's bigger? It's the bromide. So it just doesn't have enough positive mojo to bring those extra electrons in. And it stays, it stays a big, bromide's a pretty big ion and krypton is a very small atom. So, question so far? And then generally speaking, you know, anions tend to be bigger than cations because of that reason. General idea. Okay, so we talked about size. So, of course, size was the bigger you are, and uh, well, size is the further to the right, the smaller you are, and the further up, the smaller you are. So the size trend is the exact opposite of the first ionization energy. So what is the first ionization energy? That is the energy it takes to rip off an electron. So uh, think about this. Uh, you can rip off electrons, uh, but in order to do it, it takes energy. It takes energy to rip off electrons. So the electrons, they like being bound because they lose potential energy. That's it's more comfortable for them to be bound to an atom because it's lower energy than being a free electron. So, but how much energy does it take to rip off the first electron out of it? And that is the first ionization energy. And it's going to be opposite of the, the size trend, right? Because What's going to make it hard to rip off an, an electron? Well, if it's if it's an electron that's close in, so if it's a tiny atom with a really positive center, that's really hard to rip off that electron. Then again, if you have a big atom, huge atom that's not very positively charged, doesn't have a lot of attraction, then again, that 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 first electron, 
pull this right off. Oh, you want me gone? I'm gone. You know, whereas when you're uh, so here it is like uh, like like cesium, cesium over here. So cesium is there. It's this huge atom, huge atom, plus one center. Cesium is like all right. Like I'm kind of okay here. Ooh, you're gonna give me 376 kilojoules per mole. Boop, I'm gone. You know, then you get a really, I'm using neon. So neon, neon is this tiny atom, tiny atom with a plus eight center. This electron here is like, no, I like this plus eight center. And I'm so close to this nucleus. It's so wonderful. 376. No, no, I'm not moving. Thousand, no, no, two thousand. I mean, no, no, no. 2,081, fine. okay, fine, I'm gone, right? So it takes a lot of energy to, to rip off that electron, relatively speaking, to something like cesium. So you can see it's the, the other way around. So, and the trend fits too, right? So as you go down, I know, don't even think of hydrogen, but as you go down, so, I mean, hydrogen does fit the trend, but I mean, it's not as, as smooth. So lithium, big atom plus one you know it takes 520 kilojoules per mole then you've got sodium a little bigger need a little less I'm like eh, this electron's easy to rip off potassium you know a little less you know rubidium and cesium you know cesium is just this huge atom really easy to rip off the electron and cesium uh it can be but it, it has some radioactive isotopes but it's also, it has stable ones as well. So uh, cesium-131 is, has a half-life of about 30 years. It's from so many nuclear reactions. No worries. So, but generally speaking, cesium is, is, well, what we find most in the nature is stable. So unlike my mood. Uh, so uh, the other trend, so the idea, remember going, going this direction, going from left to right, the, the size increases, but you notice the, the first ionization energy tends to increase, but it's not smooth, right? So you can see here that from beryllium to boron, it goes down. And then from nitrogen to oxygen, it goes down. It's easier to rip off an electron from oxygen that is nitrogen. That's kind of weird, right? So why, why is this weird? And you can kind of see this though. So when you have oxygen, oxygen has the, the, the electronic structure of 2P4 and nitrogen has the, the all one electron in the, in the uh, degenerate 2P orbitals. So the idea, though, is since this electron here is paired up, it's actually a little bit easier to rip off that electron than this one here. So it's a little easier to rip off that electron um, from that paired orbital than it is from that completely filled shell. Well, filled, half filled shell, I should say. So you're glad it's being recorded. Well, I'm glad you're here, Eli. So, oh, is it is it my am I being comical? I don't know. I thought my stage presence was kind of lacking. I I also have these recorded just like for asynchronously. So, all right. I thought you were talking. Okay. Oh, I'm glad I'm being entertained. Entertained. Entertaining then. So, but yeah, acting of the elements. All right. <laughs> I'm looking at the Zoom, uh, the students in the classroom. What am I, why am I talking to my computer? I'm trying to fit my face in here. Okay. So how are you guys doing? Questions? So hopefully this is making sense in the combination of these, right? So if you get the, the size trend, the ionization energy trend makes sense. So let's do the same thing on the basis of periodic trends, determine which one has the highest first ionization energy. So we'll start with this one. We have aluminum and we have sulfur. So sulfur is further to the right, which means smaller size, which means higher first ionization energy. 
So right, and then we'll do pink, arsenic, or antimony. So they're down here, uh, 33 and 51 respectively. So antimony SB is the bigger element. So that means the smaller element arsenic is gonna be the one that's gonna be harder to rip off the electron. Arsenic has the higher first ionization energy. Making sense? So then let's do nitrogen or silicon. So nitrogen is further to the right, so it's a smaller atom. Nitrogen is also further up, it's a smaller atom. Therefore, nitrogen is definitely has a higher first ionization energy than silicon. So, right, because you, you're looking confused. So, well, remember, I was just thinking because nitrogen has the semi complete um, orbital. That actually makes it gives it, it makes it harder to, to rip off. Oh, that's right. Okay. Sure. Okay. Yeah. Which even, yeah. Yeah. But, um, that, that would be a little more ambiguous for, for sulfur versus nitrogen, which is already ambiguous Sulfur okay. or, or also, also oxygen. Right. So, okay. And then last one, we have oxygen and chlorine. So oxygen is further up, so it should be lower energy. Chlorine is further right, so it's going to be smaller-ish. That's going to have a higher energy. So we have it uh, conflicting. Therefore, we don't know. I would guess oxygen. Let's see if I'm right. It's oxygen. So if you look at the chart, oxygen versus chlorine, oxygen is the one there. So it actually is oxygen, but it's not clear using periodic trends. So, see that? Okay. And now that we have this awesome thing with periodic trends, that means we can have everything. The periodic table tells us everything we could ever wanna know. And the, this is not true either. So electron affinity, so electron affinity is the energy released when an element absorbs an electron. So meaning uh, when you give elements electrons, sometimes they release energy, sometimes they don't. Sometimes it takes some energy. And the thing is that there is no pair of trend. Uh, uh, well, some of them, they're just all over the place. So, it does tend to increase in general across a period, but it's not a smooth trend. So like, and some of the, some of the noble gases, they have positive, well, they have negative electron affinities and it doesn't, that doesn't make any sense because they have a full shell. You know, why would that happen? Negative meaning energy Yeah, yeah, energy released, exothermic. Negative means exothermic. Yeah, so but it's not a smooth trend, so we just can't really do that. And uh, there is then the trend, and the textbook talks about this. I I don't really like this trend, so but I'll teach it anyways. Metallic character, it's kind of like you know, tens and metallic trends in metallic character, so. Does that mean like, I guess I always, I guess I'm too competitive because I'm like, what's the best element? You know, like who is the better element? Is it silver? Is it tungsten or is it rubidium? Or maybe it's polonium, you know, which of these is the best metal, you know, kind of thing. And, but silver, silver is the most conductive of all the elements. So it's the best metal you know, kind of thing. Um, and, but if you go by this trend, francium should be the best metal, you know, because although it only exists for a few microseconds. So actually, no, I guess it's, I think it's in the order of seconds for francium. It's not very stable. This is, this one's always radioactive. Any, no, not necessarily. Um, anything after lead uh, or bismuth, some people hypothesize bismuth is not stable, but all the elements after lead and maybe bismuth are unstable or radioactive. 
So there are no stable, there are no stable uh, nuclei. So then, uh, like a heavy element decays and turns into iron. Turns into lead. Perfect. Yeah. Uh, but I mean, like uranium and thorium, they exist for billions of years. Right. So it de depends depends on the on your um, your definition of stable. So Not my <laughs> that's unfortunate. Did you guys see the movie Kate on um, on Netflix? Okay, I'm surprised. What about you guys, Zoomers? Have you seen Kate? I'm surprised no one asked me about this. What? Oh, uh, it's a popular movie. It's a cool movie. They have polonium in it. You watch Dune? It's stupid. Yeah, I saw that. No, you never. Oh man. All right. Well, if you if you watch Kate, you can see she gets she gets poisoned with polonium. Um, okay. I did see Dune. I like that, but I'm a nerd. Um, so okay, what's that? Oh, McTowell character. So the the idea here is. It's uh, it's not necessarily trying to find the, the best metal. So as I'm talking about different metals, the idea is that as you move in, in this direction, the metallic character decreases, which makes sense because like if you have lithium, that's definitely a metal. Beryllium, definitely a metal. Boron, I don't know, kind of like both. Carbon, I don't know, it's kind of like a non-metal. It's mostly like a non-metal, but it can conduct electricity and heat. And the yeah, nitrogen, like, nope, nope. Definitely not a metal, definitely not a metal. Fluorine, nope. Neon, no, nope. These are not, these These are definitely, oh, what did I last time? Why is it moving? Stop moving. Bad iPad. Those are definitely not metals. But you could make arguments for boron or carbon, whether they're kind of metalish. Carbon is more non-metalish, but it has some metalish kind of things. But beryllium and lithium, definitely not metals. Uh, then same thing along the, the, the column of carbon. Carbon, as I've already mentioned, it's a non-metal, but it, it, you could argue it's kind of metallic. It's Got some conduction properties that that have heat and electricity that make you think eh, maybe it's kind of metal, metallic. Silicon, oh, well, it can kind of conducts sometimes. Doesn't always conduct. Same thing with germanium. You're like, well, it's sort of a conductor, a semiconductor. You get the tin, you're like, oh nope, that's a metal. And lead, oh yeah, that's a metal kind of thing. Those are definitely not non-metals. Those are metals. So whereas carbon, you're like. Eh, it's more of a non-metal, but kind of a metal. And silicon is, eh, it's not really a non-metal. It sometimes it acts like a non-metal, but it doesn't always conduct. So it sort of conducts. So it's called a semiconductor, but it also can bond with hydrogen and we can make oil out of it to lubricate engines. So it's kind of like a non-metal, you know? Same thing with germanium, a little less than silicon. We don't really have silicon oils. Tin, definitely a metal. So questions? Uh, if the trend kind of makes sense, why is it so much of it? Because I like um, atomic size, helium is the smallest atom. Francium is the biggest. So first ionization energy, helium is the smallest. Francium is the biggest. We can compare across it. So I, I can't. I can't tell you what's a better metal, zirconium or silver. By this definition, zirconium is a better metal than silver. But then silver conducts the best. Right. Right. So, you know, so it has a more powerful atomic or metallic property than than zirconium. So it's a little like ambiguous. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So Oh, and I guess here are some of those. I can use my pair table. This is prettier. Mine's prettier. Where's my pair table? Right, and I, I also silicon. So here's here's carbon, of course. You know, it's definitely that's the diamond. But uh, silicon, silicon's kind of cool. It's it's uh, it's shiny. If you look at it, it sparkles. 
So, and um, it actually has a diamond structure. It's like a hippo head. Hippo head, yeah. So here's a, you can see here, here's a, here's a, here's a metal, um, uh, is it silicon gold? Okay, I'll see, okay, yep. So this is a really shiny piece of, sil of silicon. All right, so, but then you get this to tin. This is definitely, this is definitely a metal. You can mash it up, you can melt it, and you can do, you know, here's a bar of it, right? So if this is a metal, I don't know what is. Okay, all right, so I guess we'll stop there. My shut up alarm has told me to shut up. So, all right, so hopefully you enjoyed a talk and you can, if you, Glad I recorded it. You can show someone else. Show a friend. It's going to be on YouTube, right? Maybe I'll become viral and, and make 20 cents after all the viewing. So anybody have any questions? Nope. Okay. Thank you. Oh, you're welcome. How do I? You're welcome. Uh, move this. Have a good day. You too.